Hello, and 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 welcome to the, the Guild Wars Two podcast. I'm your host, Dad or Son, or or just a little boy. <laughs> Hello, hello. I, um, I'm joined today with uh, my my best friends in the world who don't argue with each other at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> George Weeman and Liam Edwards. <laughs> Ah, ah! Oh, so let's let's do a quick fire. Let's make a uh, quick fire. We asked you on Twitter for for some questions. No, we we asked you for some <laughs> answers. Uh, if you had, if you had an intro music, which song would it be and why? Um, mostly mostly people just sent the music and not answered why, but that's okay. That's okay. That's totally fine. Um, uh, Shane Lewis. Uh, oh yeah, I know Shane Lewis. He's I think. Lewis. Uh, on on any other day by the police. Yeah, Ooh, I have yeah. not heard of that. Nice, nice and smooth. Nice and smooth. Yeah, goes down like whiskey. That definitely, some, definitely some, not some like whiskey. Some chill, soft rock. We got uh, uh, Shin. Shoot, I forgot how to say your name. Shin uh, Sinyoku. <laughs> This is going so you, great. There's a guy, this guy who used to do a lot of uh, Guild Wars 2 streams back in the day. Um, Toho, uh, because I'm on something from Toho, because um, I'm such a nerd. So, so sure. you just walk down the street and Toho plays in the background? Yes, I, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, we got Molo Madness, um, Hero, by Hero, uh, really slow motion. Really slow motion. I gotta, I gotta give that a listen. Hmm. I wonder what activities you do while that that plays. I, I think, I think this is like the picture looks epic. Like somebody <laughs> slamming down on a mountain. I don't know, man. Um, we got Ob- Aubrey. Every time I see her name, I think Audrey or, or something like that. I don't, I don't know why. Aubrey says uh, Final Fantasy X two really motion intro. Hmm. Mm hmm. So, so when they walk into a room, things get like glamorous and poppy. I, I, I think, I think. We, we, let me give it a listen. Real quick. I like the intro to that. Oh, oh, it, it, oh, it is the intro. Yeah, yeah. When Yuna's singing. Ah, very, yeah, very k poppy. Oh, we got, we got the legend, uh, Patrick, uh, Full Metal Alchemist. I can't see the name. Can I? <laughs> I can't see the name. It's it's from Brotherhood, not the not the oh, first one. Okay, I'm down with that. Far East Sweet. Does that play when you fart in your sleep? Um, no, I don't believe it does. And I, I love that soundtrack. That's 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 a good. That's, yeah. That's a good pick. You eat again. That's a good pick. That's a great song. That's good. That that's soundtrack. Good. We got uh, Connor with uh, R J D two Ghost Rider. Um, cool. We got we got. Uh, <laughs> Can I point God. out? Can I point out yep. the Pog Hub content manager? Oh, uh, what? Who uh, has uh, said "Ride on Shooting Stars" from FLCL by The Pillows? Oh man, fucking great song! Yeah, that's such a like sweet nostalgic soundtrack. Ride on Shooting Stars. Ooh, great song. You got Sean with a uh, bolt thrower. Um, Sento, Sento Tap. I said no tap? I don't know. I like Settle how tap. we can't pronounce most of these. <laughs> Settle tap. Oh, I'm pretty sure. Um, and let's see. Let's see. What's, what's a cup? We got some ba- um, Bon Jovi by an unending internal screaming. That's... Oh, no, that's his name. Not, not, the, <laughs> not what, sings, what Bon Jovi sings. Um, we got uh, Colin with elevator music. That's... <laughs> that's good. That's good. Uh, that's That's good. That's good. Um, we got uh, K Blade with Guile's theme. That's that's actually not yeah, bad. That's a classic. Goes with everything. Da 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 da. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. What, what's other man? You guys have some like rocker stuff. We have an audience that loves that rocker. Ooh, Angel likes um, Death Note. Here's cool. theme. Yeah. I, Here's theme is pretty good. It'd be pretty like intense. Your whole life would be on edge, constantly. Um, Red Dead Redemption Two Unbroken. Um, this is by T Campo, twenty eight. Unbroken. I don't remember that one. T Campo, twenty eight. 
Mondo number five. My, my number taste five. in music, it's just, it's just shit. I don't know any of these. <laughs> it's just <laughs> non-existent. Actually, you know, I don't know many of these either. <laughs> And I came up with a question, and I actually, I might have to go through some of these and actually listen to. <laughs> so let me let me ask you guys then. I'm not gonna make it easy and say, you know, what just any song would be like. What is it? The the intro music to your life. Uh, specifically, what Limp Biscuit song would be the intro song to your life? Oh, definitely rolling. See, I, I, I uh, like to ride my bike everywhere, so I definitely would want that in the background of, of my, my mind. It's all about the nookie. Oh, oh yeah? It's all about the nookie. I don't know the name of the song. That's all I know about the song is all about the nookie. That's it. I'm going to have to... I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go with my way. It's your way or the highway? <laughs> <laughs> um, God... I'm gonna have it stuck in my head now when I ride my bike. I just realized I've been reading their, uh, not their ats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've been know reading like their, their subject line for their beast so it comes like before their at names. Oh, uh, that's fine. Lo Low Death Grips and Matthew says Creep by Radiohead. So I, I thought I'd give that a mention. I wonder why. You guys don't listen to Radiohead? You guys don't have a little I, radio? I know some Radiohead. <laughs> yeah, I, I know Creep. And welcome to this episode. So, what you guys have been playing? <laughs> or or not playing? Or watching? I, I, I tried to pick up Sekiro again. Oh, wow. You're not really a Dark Souls fan. A From Software fan. If you're not playing Sekiro. I, well <laughs> You guys remember uh, uh, Snake Eyes, You're right? recording in a graveyard? Yes, I do remember that. Oh, oh my, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to record in a graveyard again. You guys remember Snake uh, Eyes? No, this uh, time Snake you can Eyes. record in Japan. <laughs> I, you guys remember Snake Eyes, right, from the gun yep. fort? Shiro Fuji. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you have a, a hard time with, with, with her? Or? No. Um, yeah, like, so this is right when I kind of figured out how to just break the game? Yeah, cheese. Oh. <laughs> yeah, go on, go on. I'm interested. Yeah, this is when I figured out like all you have to do is just keep banging her, and she just wow. keeps blocking, and then dodge, and you just dodge out of her like stupid oh, hits again. that are like um, I mean, their their auto um, auto aim attacks. Kind of yeah. like even if you dodge out the way, she can still grab you. You have to actually be away from her. Oh yeah, the danger, yeah. the danger attack. Yeah, she can like claw you towards her. You don't even have to do that. You can just run straight past her, down the left, around the ca cavern enough to draw the gunfire of the other guys, but not get hit. But also just enough to not aggro her, and she will walk oh back, God. and then you can just sneak up and stealth kill one of her health bars. Really? Okay. Yeah. So what I've been what I've been doing is um just just straight up charging her head on, uh, uh as as Matt would say, banging her until her stamina <laughs> meter is like I don't know a, a third to a half full. But then for whatever reason, I'm not quite like visually tracking how it's happening. But my postured stamina meter will at that point usually be be big enough for me not to finish it off, and um. I've, I I will then just like if if I if I take enough hits or use enough health potions or have to resurrect at least once I'll just run away and homeward idle back home. I haven't technically died from her, but she is uh, guarding that chunk of of territory, and I have considered running past her too. But you know I want to be uh, <laughs> honorable mm. and 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 defeat the enemies that are in my way rather than oh run past them. Well, you're running away, so. Oh, I'm sure it's honorable in, 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 in your mind. But, <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, besides that, I'm also exploring the, the the depths where there was another Snake Eyes who was a lot easier around the, the obligatory Dark Souls Poison Swamp Tunnel. Um, and uh, there's there's the Ghost Men. Yeah, I, there's not much that I think I can really say that's like going to gonna refresh any anymore from from last time i picked it up besides the fact that it is surprisingly easier to pick up after after all this time i thought i might forget the controls and the timing of everything but once i um 
Once once I basically remembered how the item buttons worked, it all came back pretty naturally. But yeah, I guess the only real complaint I do have is the placement of those item buttons. Uh, toggling between items with the D-pad and then using it with the D-pad is pretty weird. And pressing triangle to toggle one at a time between your prosthetics is something that I think has messed me up a few times too. But... Yeah, for for a game that's like famous for being hard and difficult and whatnot, I I was like I think I've had a harder time picking up Dark Souls games, especially Bloodborne, after weeks of not playing <clears throat> compared to this one. It's just it's so silky, buttery, smooth. That yeah, I was gonna say like after having not played it for a while and then jumping into like New Game Plus for a little bit, just the ability to like fly between buildings allows you to get into the sort of flow of the game and the fluidness of it really quickly. Yeah, it's a good uh, evasive maneuver. Like like the snake eyes at the bottom of the, the depths, you can just zip in a circle in front of them and, and draw their fire until you're until it's you that's ready to fight instead of them. That's a good game. But uh yeah. Yeah, don't don't have much to talk about. Have didn't get particularly much farther than when I left off. Just a little deeper into the depths and a little deeper into the fort. You will never finish that game, will you, George? I'm sure I will eventually. I just, I just, I, for whatever reason, it is not hooking me like some other stuff is these days. Like, like the, uh, uh the Sims. The th- <laughs> <laughs> you made us. I, I did. You made us. Did you tweet that out? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I did a stream where I played around with uh, your Sims. Le- Liam showed up for a little bit. Um, Liam, were that you were were you there for when I was playing with the VR heads? <laughs> like I was, I was sort of, I had to, I was getting busy about the time you started fight dicking around with the VR headset, and it was yeah. a little unsettling for anybody who's missed it, right? So imagine George, obviously being George, gets excited about using VR in The Sims and attaching it to basically using walk- VR in the way it's not supposed to be used yeah. to walk around in our house together. Quote, unquote. Um, quote, unquote. <laughs> but uh, imagine him then just sneaking up on himself in the bathroom, his own sim, and then trying to stare as close as possible into his own junk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. That's wow. That. I mean, wouldn't you? Uh, no. The, the next thing I did with, with the VR headset plugged into the sims <laughs> was stick my head in the oven. I stuck my head in the toilet. I, I got a first-person view of my sim eating a TV dinner at 3 a.m. while depressing music plays in the background. And that was ultimately what decided, what, what, what prompted me to turn it off and put it back on. But yeah, uh, with Vorpex, you can, um, and the, the FPS mode that they put in the sims 4, you can get a surprisingly competent, VR vision of your house, you're not going to want to use it for regular gameplay, but it was a pretty damn great novelty being able to uh, fly around a house that you build yourself with a a VR view of that house that kind of puts your head in the perspective of your own creation. It felt, it felt intimate and special. (laughs) VR sim seems (laughs) I have no words. Like it should work. I wonder why they haven't made one yet. That's that's actually pretty good. Uh, the you know the, the audience is is is, is limited. And it's yeah, it's, I mean, it's they the could typical even tack that on like <laughs> just like Warpex does, and it will still be pretty cool actually. Seeing like the your your own toy box, people would love yes. that. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, you you don't want to play The Sims like this. Because uh, Vorpex turns mouse movement into... It turns your head movements into mouse movement. Oh. Which means that when your head is bopping around, the, the game's cursor that you're actually trying to click on and interact with stuff is going crazy. But The Sims 4, if you press Shift-Tab, brings you into a first-person view of your Sims that is surprisingly well-engineered. It cuts off your Sims' head so that the camera's not clipping through your Sims' head and puts a camera on top of their neck. So if you, like, look down, you, you'll you see a hole in your body where the textures aren't being rendered on the other side. Right. And um, you use a mouse wheel to adjust your field of view. And it looks a little bit weird in the headset until you start playing with that mouse wheel to match up the field of view with your Sim with the field of view of your own eyeballs. And once you do, you can fall. You can get a Sims eye view of what life in the house that you made is like, 
And if you take a, if you zoom out of that FPS view and press tab, you get a floating FPS style camera that um, will not be following along your your sim's shoulders and bopping along with with their own head movements, but is more or less like a, a, a FPS no clip mode. And um, that's that's I think when the magic really clicked with me was when I started just swooping the camera around whatever angles I could wrestle it in, and it uh, felt smooth and natural, and the proportions and the depth of everything looked surprisingly okay. I uh, I if 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 you got this weird software and weird hardware on your computer, I would highly recommend playing around with it for just ten to fifteen minutes. It is damn good fun and and uh like i said a strangely intimate and meaningful experience swooping around your own creations in vr speaking of vr Ooh, oh, 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 oh oh something hot and spicy give it to me liam i gotta try the oculus quest yes tell, tell me about it i haven't got a chance to tell us all guys i'm sold hell, hell yeah. yeah can you believe it after two years it took a wireless headset to sell me on it it is amazing yeah and like is it just me or did you kind of consider okay yeah yeah this is actually a way more simple question than i was framing it do you consider that a video game console or something else it's a console for sure it's it's (laughs) it's its own thing it is fully its own thing you can take that thing anywhere like you could with a switch and you can play Mm -hmm. it anywhere and the stuff that it does to like help with that like interfacing everything inside of the vr headset like being easily able to access your games and media while having it on and also having like the camera stuff that has the room sensors that tells you like not to step so far you just so you don't feel like you're blindly walking around places it's quite incredible and like how do games they do have that? these natural like wall sensors in them it's kind of hard to explain like when you're playing a game, so I only played two games with it. One was the new Vader Immortal thing that nice. is only for Oculus Quest, which I'll get yeah, onto. The in killer there. app. And the other was <laughs> Beat Saber. And it's my right. first time playing Beat Saber. Nice. And Beat Saber was great, but you know, you don't really have to move too much from the spot. Right. But like with Vader Immortal, you are basically escaping like a what do you call the big Huge, massive, fucking... What are they called? Star Destroyers or whatever? Is it a triangle? Triangles or Star Destroyers? Yeah, the, the big triangle. I'm pretty sure it's a Star Destroyer. And you're trying to escape off a Star Destroyer while trying to avoid Vader this whole time. And my word. Like, being in rooms on this Star Destroyer and being able to literally just walk around it. Like, you can use the like uh, the controllers to, like you know, teleport yourself like you can in other video games. But this game just allows you to walk. You can just walk everywhere. It's so cool. Like, you can walk up to door panels and then, like, fiddle with them and press buttons and shit and then just walk all the way back. And it's, like, it is immersion that I've never really felt before. How, how does it know where your walls in real life are? Like, how does it draw the, the box? Well, that's the thing is, what what happens is it, 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 it tracks the room scale. So it has something like a... A 20 feet by 20 feet grid area. That's that a lot of feet. It won't allow you to go past that scenario. What happens is in the game, if you're about to like walk towards something, it'll come up with like a wireframe mesh mm. type thing. Guardian. Like, like almost like Tron-esque like wireframe. And it'll be like, and it'll like try and stop you from going there. And it doesn't feel intrusive too much. It just... You take a couple of step backs so, uh, or maybe you teleport to the, the area and then you continue walking around and stuff like that. But it also has like uh, the room, like it has cameras on the front. So it will show you a visualization of the room inside of the headset, almost like you're looking Whoa. at it for a camera. Mm-hmm. So you always can sort of get the sense of where you are positioned in, in your room and stuff. Like, I don't think the quest would be too great in my apartment because I would only be able to walk in like straight or backwards directions. But within the space I was playing in, it was a, it was fantastic. And so Vader, with the- well, a Vader Immortal, just quickly, ten dollars. Like if you got an Oculus Quest, you need to fucking get that shit. That is that is amazing. 
So with the HTC Vive, you have two base stations looking at you from opposite angles of the side of the room. Correct. They also want you to kind of draw a box on the floor with the controllers. So the um, cameras use the positional data of where the controllers are in relation to the box you draw on the setup to know where your room is. It's not It's not even close. Like, it's disparagingly different. Inside-out tracking, right? No base stations, it, right? Yeah, inside-out tracking. Nothing. There's no sensor. So, there's no nothing. I'm wondering if it, like, shoots an IR beam out of the helmet and, and like, I there's don't... Like, like, you can see cameras kind of, all around the headset. It has. Is it like a sonar thing? How does it know what counts as solid ha- wall and what doesn't? It has. It has like uh, cameras on the front of it, as Matt was saying. Mm. And also, uh, from what the Oculus guy was telling me, was that the controllers also help with like detecting like how far you are from the ground and stuff like that. Like it's all fully motion detected. Like if you tilt your head, if you move your like body like if you start walking your character will start walking it's it's just insane it's they so were working on this um immersive. like way back and and they're like we have to get this because this is like the next step and i was like man no sensors and just for them to just pop that out now is it's crazy a couple years yeah. already passed it, it feels like uh, this almost should have happened earlier. It's such an elegant solution to just put the cameras on the helmet itself. You, 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 you got to start somewhere, though. Con- yeah, exactly. And considering it is like the first try of a company doing this, my God, did they nail it. Mm-hmm. Like, they nailed it's it. Facebook it just, money. It, it just works. <laughs> yeah. I just can't believe how well it works. It is so immersive. You just, you just get sucked in completely. Like, VR is great in that regard anyway. But, you know, you've always been tied to it, either a chair or, like, one bit of square space in a room. And, you you know, you decalibrate and stuff like that all the time. But, like, with the Quest, I just, within, like, the 40 minutes I was playing with it, I didn't have any issues whatsoever. Uh, and for something that is self-contained within the headset itself, it's not that heavy. It doesn't feel any different from, like, other VR headsets in, in terms of its weight, considering it has all of this inside of it. And also the resolution is like not noticeable at all. Like it's from Oh yeah, that's that's the next big thing to consider. The screen can, door effect, the distant visibility. No, like from what I can remember, it's probably better than the PS4 VR. No, of mm-hmm. course it is. In, re- what you, what in resolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Resolution is low on yeah. PS VR. <laughs> but it's self contained in up the headset. From everything. Which is incredible. Like the fact that it's outputting that power and it has like three hours of battery life. It's doing all this tracking while also running the game itself. It's it's amazing. How how do you recharge it? You just plug it in, like a USB C or the something wall? like that. Like the the Oculus guys themselves had like a you know like a big mobile battery packs uh-huh. <laughs> that you would charge like your Switch with and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. They they brought them along for they the demos. Them along, yeah, and they had like little uh, holders so you could still wear the VR headset while charging it and stuff. It's amazing. And, wow. Um, the only, the only it, issue. It lasts about two and a half hours without it. You could just play it's it for a... two hours, like no, non anyway. You could yeah. go to the park and play it if you wanted all the open space. <laughs> Maybe don't do that anywhere other than Japan because mm-hmm. think you just get robbed. But yeah. isn't the only, that the sad fact? The only problem that I found with it is that the uh, the light let in by where it connects to your nose is larger yep. than I've experienced before. Yeah, yeah, that's something I've noticed between the headsets as well, is that the PSVR covers your face up a little more than, than the others. They they want you to have some kind of window to the outside world in case you bump into stuff. Yeah, in the Oculus, if, think. if you look down, it is noticeable. You will see your own feet and the floor. But, you know, once you're staring at the screen itself, uh-huh. you know, you get sucked in. Yeah. And ignore it. It's just very noticeable from the uh, another Another solution to that problem I've found is just turn your lights off. There you oh, go. You can do that. I mean, you're blind anyway, so you might as yep. well could be in the dark. Bump, bumping into stuff is fun. Just honest to God, anybody wants to sponsor us so we can buy one for the show and share it between us now and again. <laughs> yeah, just fucking go ahead. We are. I want that we, shit so badly now. <laughs> <laughs> we live on the opposite ends of the world. Of, yeah, uh, yeah. Shipping might make up for the cost of the unit itself. <laughs> <laughs> I I want to say um, 
like for anyone who was thinking about buying it, uh, the only thing that you uh, have to worry about, of course, is the battery life, but you can kind of fix that with like a battery pack. And that the the actual controllers are tracked by the headset, uh, by the cameras on the headset. Yes. So if you were to bring your hand back all the way, it might lose a little bit of tracking. But thanks to like magic, <laughs> it doesn't do it all the time. Yeah. yeah like I, Oculus has magic. Like they, you, like it's been magic since since those little sensors we can just plop down anywhere. But like um, uh, that's the only time where having sensors would work a little bit better but i'm pretty like, sure they're gonna fix that in the it's, next it's iteration. weird because to combat that a little bit like they try and i don't know whether this is on purpose but you bringing it up made me think of something in uh vader immortal which is when when you want an item like it's it's supposedly on your belt like the character's mm. belt so you have to actually look down and like physically grab it with the controller yeah. So it wants you to point like the camera down towards your waist, so then you can track it. That's game design. And it, it feel it feels amazing, like in regards to you know you're not just pressing a button and then magically things are appearing in your hands. Even yeah. if you are a floating body and you have like a lightsaber and like a a utility tool on your belt, when you go down to pick them up off your belt and like scoop them off and then <laughs> it's amazing. It's such an incredible feeling. Yeah, it feels uh, great having to reenact body language, dramatic body yes. language in, in like, VR. Batman did did that belt thing, too, and it just felt so good to, like, swoop your hand down to your hip and flick a batarang out. It, you, ooh, it's it's have, it's a different way of, of interacting. Have many, games, have many games done, like, ladder climbing and stuff? No, that's always been harder to, to nail. Yeah, there's the climb. That was, like, one of the launch titles. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because, you see, I'm coming from the reference of the janky PSVR stuff. Okay, yeah, so I don't know of anything like that. I've played way too many VR games. And I, and I will say, like, when I was climbing the ladder on the side... out. On the outside of like the Star Destroyer hanging over this giant lava planet where you can look down and I'm climbing and I'm using the controllers to move my hands and like pull myself up and like grabbing them by like squeezing my hands oh, around the controller wait. and stuff is amazing. And then when like the ladder breaks during the thing and I'm like hanging over the edge, I'm like, oh fuck, oh fuck. <laughs> There's it's a so sprint good. vector. On, on PSVR has you uh, pulling yourself up on, on vertical surfaces with arm motions too and yeah no it, it, it can happen on PSVR I don't think it's it's as accurate as, as the other platforms but I yeah. uh, there's just, at least one in, example that came to me eventually. In the Oculus Quest like just like pulling yourself up a ladder and then like having the ability to move off the ledge like once you pull yourself up and then physically actually like push yourself and move forward because you can because there's no wires and then like step onto the platform as you said like that repeating like body action that you would naturally do is so cool i sound like such a moron to people who played vr extensively but as like just an experience of the quest itself it was if this is the one this is the one that people first experience that's i mean you're completely yeah, like, okay if, because, it, like, I would 100% recommend people buy this thing. Yeah. Like, I know the price is high as well, like $400 or whatever. But fuck. But it's a, it's it's a console, though. It's a console. It you don't console. have to worry about mm -hmm. buying. You know, I, I would yep. definitely want to buy wireless a wireless headset later on in my life where it could just plug into your graphics card and it's the same thing. You know, I want a little bit more power. Oh, jeez. But... <laughs> the fact but, that I don't um, need a PC and I don't need yeah that kind of shit, I'm yeah. like ecstatic about that anyway. But the fact that you can do all this like just movement is amazing. And what is cool about this and what I have hope for is that because the quest is like pretty much sold out and it seems to be getting you know incredible reviews and like it's praised by a lot of people is that developers are going to look at it as a console. Are gonna you know they're not going to try and outscope it with VR games that you know, can't be played on the quest because of power or like graphical concerns. So like, I hope like whoever's making VR games right now, like they make games so they, that it definitely works on the quest as well, because th that thing will be majorly popular. It, it I mean, they don't, they don't 
have like crappy games on here. They have Robo Recall on here, which is Robo Recall looks good. I think I mean, it should be able to handle what it needs to handle. Yeah, they, I, I mean, the Vader Immortal thing in there. was mind blowing. I was like, right, because because you can physically walk around everywhere. So I I was like walking right up to aliens and like literally just staring them in the face, one to one, like looking at all the textures on their face and everything. Yeah. It was so sticking cool. your face in their junk. Yeah, I like looked up a droid skirt. It was it was amazing. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> It was as long as you have rec room, um, you're, you're all good, Liam. As long as you have was, rec room. Oh, man. Like, it was mind-blowing. It was great. Then you could play with us. Yeah. I, I, I guess my, my only real big concern is, like, software library. But there's something called side-loading where you can uh, put third-party apps on there. Because I want... I want my my shady shit. I want emulators and and VR mods for games that aren't supposed to be in VR. I want porn. I want to. We've all seen your latest video. I I want to make sure that whatever headset I buy has a substantial library of shady, janky, unpolished shit. Cause that's man, a lot of a lot of fun light bulbs blink in your head when when you go through that stuff. <laughs> it reminds me of the good old days of like modding Homer Simpson into Jedi Knight Two Jedi Outcast. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I don't. I I I don't know if you could actually do all that and how easy it is to do that, but uh, there there are modders working on it. It's it's feasible. It's which actually makes it a little tempting for for me as well. Can you imagine not having to set up that stupid PSVR crap? The little yeah, camera? yeah. I started mentally picturing that with and the. You'd be able to walk around, George. You'd oh, be able dude. to walk around, yeah. George. Okay, so, so <laughs> turn that thing on and just it works. Just turn it on the, like the, you do with a switch. switch on standby. Yeah, amazing. the Switch VR. That's that's how that works. And I didn't like think about how big of a deal it would be until the Switch VR, where where there are no cables. You are meant to just pop it on and off in a quick session. And that makes VR a lot more of a friendly proposition. Like it pr- used to be where I had to make sure that they, I had like 30 to 40 minutes to spare. And that's one of the things that's turning me over with these reviews of the Oculus Quest is that they're talking about how shorter VR play sessions are more viable. And that's kind of sort of how VR is meant to be utilized anyway because that's what uh what prevents motion sickness is is popping it on and off every now and then and taking a quick bathroom break or something well this is the thing right like this is the the period this is the beginning period of where vr becomes accessible for normal it's still four hundred dollars normal people are going to experience it like labo vr is like the kids introduction and the family introduction and now the quest is like oh shit we don't need like a high-end PC to run this. We don't need to have any technical skills with cabling or whatever. It's not going to take us 30 minutes to set it up and all. And we don't have to have like a, a room in our mansion to be able to play it. We just buy this thing, turn it on, buy a game on the store or a demo, or we play it. We'll play it anywhere. Is the audio audio? How's audio? Is it built Surprisingly in? Surprisingly good. And and it has like a it has like a uh, a like a headphone jack in it as well. So you can plug a headphone jack in it or like it doesn't have like uh, what um, the other VR feel, headsets have, which is like their, their weird like... Yeah, you feel like the vibrations through the strap. Overlaying ear thing. It's, it's it, it like, it's playing at you and I was in a room full of people and yet all I could hear was the audio of the VR. So it's working pretty well. Nice. Like it's not exactly the most crystal clear thing in the world, but it's basically just like watching a TV. Like or like hearing the audio of a TV very close to you. It's it's really good. If any rich listeners of Dan's sons <laughs> want to buy three Oculus Quest, please go ahead. Oh my God. At this point, I, just, it, anybody. I I add one thing. Um, for people who have been playing VR for a while, like the thing that most excites me about this is you set up the the VR for regular room stuff, right? Um, your rec room and and dead and buried but then you want to play things like elite dangerous and you just want to sit down and you sometimes have to redo the calibration or move the sensors depending on what you have your setup um because i mean not everyone's gonna have like your table in the middle of the room you know so your 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 sensors can actually track that when you're actually sitting down quest just does it that's annoying it's so annoying um, that's the part that gets me the most is yeah. that having to set up the sensors for when I want to switch positions, 
Um, Quest just scans and, your room and like yeah, and then knows done. what the fuck is going on. It's yeah, it's magic. It's the little things like that that gets me. And you can what, what was even cooler was that it has like an app for your phone, so you can buy all the games for it, like without having to put it on. You have this app, and the app allows you to stream whatever the person is playing in VR to your phone, so you can watch what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Like if you're playing with a friend, like that, you like you know, with PSVR, you could probably watch it on TV or whatever and all that kind of thing. But you know, oh well, Oculus Quest, what are you gonna do? Well, they've already thought of it. It just streams it straight to your phone or to like a HD device, and it's like you can see what the what your friend's up to and all that kind of thing. <laughs> Wirelessly. Wirelessly. Eh, that's real cool. Yeah. It is very cool. As a slight tangent to that. Well, there you go. The reason I uh, got to play the Oculus Quest is because it's that time of year over here in Japan. Bit Summit. It was Bit Summit this weekend, which is maybe why you can tell my voice is fucked. <laughs> yeah, you sound you sound a little uh, a little hoarse. Horsey. <laughs> yeah, my uh, voice is massively fun but yes it was bit summit this weekend and a lot of cool people came to town including people from oculus which is why i got to have a nice fuck around with the uh, quest uh and a lot of other things i just want to have a quick shout out uh, like thank you to all of the lovely dad and the sons listeners who came up to me during bit summit which was uh, a new and surprisingly strange experience whoa yeah how many? But like maybe 15 or so. Holy cow. Yeah, in Japan, in an indie festival in Kyoto. Crazy. <laughs> in Japan. In Japan. Oh, man. Holy cow. Yeah, so all of the sons and dads out there in, uh, well, out in here, I guess, Kyoto, uh, for, who came to Bit Summit and then came up to me and were like, are you Liam? Oh, uh, well, my name tag says <laughs> Liam, so good guess, but why? <laughs> Thank you for coming up and talking. It was so nice to hear from people who listen to the show and pestering me about who is the dad, who is the sons, and <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, it was really cool. Sounds like a so, good time. Bid Summit continually being a great festival. I hope everybody who came up and spoke about the podcast did enjoy Bit Summit. It was a lot of people's first times. Um, but yeah, it, it was Bit Summit again this uh, year, and Bit Summit's always like the best time of year. Uh, but. I didn't get to play fucking anything this year. I didn't get to play anything. I why? don't know why. I got to play like maybe three or four games in total. Just so busy doing other stuff that I felt kind of like it was both simultaneously the best bit summit for meeting people and also the worst for actually going to like an event to play games. Mm. I felt bad. And, like, the two games that I actually, two of the four games I went to play were at the same booth, and they were both Streets of Rage 4 and Windjammers 2. <laughs> Was so, this, uh, like, um, <laughs> uh, oh, God, what is the company Frank Cifaldi works for? Dot Emu. Was it, like, some Dot Emu? It um, was. It was Dot Emu's ah. booth. Yeah. How did I know? Yeah, it was Dot yeah, Emu's Those booth. Genesis classics. Both are looking pretty hot, though. Like, they have this really similar... Uh, I think it's the guys who did, like, uh, what was it Wonder Boy? The Dragon's Trap or whatever that came out on the Switch that had that really nice hand-drawn art style. Yep, yep. It is, like, that uh, type of art style for both of them. Streets of Rage looks kind of uh, a bit more gritty, trying to keep that Streets of Rage feel to it, but it felt nice and chunky. It was super difficult, though. And then Windjammers, you know, completely changing from pixel art has like this really awesome hand-drawn style. Animations were sick. Look really good. Pretty standard stuff, to be fair. Like, you know, Dot Emu is starting to get a reputation for themselves. Oh yeah, they used to be not, <laughs> they used to not have a reputation for themselves. Yeah. The, um, back, back in like, I think it was 2015 when they did the uh, uh, 20 year Neo Geo Humble Bundle pack. Oh, the games yeah. were just kind of running through a, a a janked up version of MAME that, um, Good old or, or similar, like unofficial emulator repackaged as an official product. And you couldn't really change key bindings or resolution options. And it was, it was slim pickings. And nowadays they're like the, the cream of the crop. 
Yeah, they're doing pretty good. And, um, I mean, they were pretty, you know, pretty well polished. You know, sequels to game series that are already pretty popular anyway. It's kind of not what Bid Summit's about, but they were pretty good. Uh, there was nothing really that stood out massively this year. Um, I obviously only got to play four games. I did, however, guys, get to continue that wonderful streak of uh, meeting new people. Oh yeah, yeah. You 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 do that often, and <laughs> I, uh, I I saw some pictures on there of of one one particularly prolific legend. Yes, and so obviously it's kind of a running joke that. Matt likes to bring up now and again. Yep. <laughs> yep. That I know everybody. Which is bullshit. You're, 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 you're networking. Because I never met this person before. You you, you have your, your community in, in Kyoto here. That... Yeah. Kyoto is Kyoto's the home of video games. It's where it, yeah, everybody comes. I can't help it. <laughs> but what I do want to mention what was like a life highlight was that we, uh, you know, the company I work for, Q Games, we had a, like... You know, a company party on Saturday, which uh, the company traditionally does for BitSummit. And, uh, you know, developers from all around the world get to come. But alongside of that, quite a few uh, homegrown Kyoto natives sometimes come along. And uh, this year we had a very special guest, which uh, I don't get starstruck very often. But I could barely talk to this guy. <laughs> it was Koji Kondo. Ooh. Hell yeah. So, okay, I'm sure oh. we all know who and what Koji Kondo is, but for listeners yeah. who don't know, maybe those who lean on the younger side of things. Uh, How are you listening to this podcast if you don't? <laughs> like, like the most famous video game composer next to Nobuo Oimatsu is, is Koji Kondo. You probably at least know like 10 of his songs just culturally. It anyway. burned into your memory. Yeah. Because they're also extremely catchy, melodic, like like video game music designed for video game music. Like, like, like the, the, this, the engineer spearheading what the rules for video game music should be yes. is Koji Kondo. Every Mario theme up to like... Mario Sunshine, every Zelda theme up to like maybe Twilight Princess, every bit of famous Nintendo music ever made in the beginning was Koji Kondo. And getting to talk to him extensively, he was so nice and he was so happy to talk to people. He was really shy, but Aww. he was willing to talk about everything and like... We got to take photos with him, but he was like, no SNS. So, like, don't post on social networks. So I had to hold off from posting a picture. But, man, it was, it was just such an amazing, like, I don't know how you, like, I've never really felt starstruck before. And there were other cool people that bid some of this weekend. Like, there was Sakamoto-san, the guy who made Super Metroid, and his son came along, and they were so cool. And I also met Shinya Takahashi, who is pretty much like the third in command at Nintendo himself. The guy who was in the video announcing that Metroid Prime had been delayed. <laughs> so like, there was like a lot of people, Koji fucking Kondo. It was, ah, guys, I, I'm still grinning from ear to ear, like right now. What a legend. I have his business card and he signed the back <laughs> of it. And I'm like, I will treasure this forever. <laughs> You'll never wash those hands again. I will. I will never. I. I can barely get my voice back because I gave it all to him. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> uh, I. 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 I don't have much. I. I. I also played a bit of Puyo Puyo Tetris. I feel like everyone except me has has had Puyo Puyo Tetris on their Switch this whole time. I um, don't I, actually. Oh, oh, you're, the you're demo one of the was few. Like pretty extensive enough to play. See, they're very generous and fun and free. They are. So I didn't buy the game. <laughs> um, I, I, I hesitated to pick it up because I'm, I'm too colorblind to play Puyo Puyo by its default settings. I, I trudged through the, the options, picked a, a visual style that. It works with my brain and started learning how to play that from scratch zero because I've never gotten into it before. But the story mode is like surprisingly all right. It's one of the few 
thankfully, they're completely aware of what utter nonsense it is and how preposterous it is to have a story mode in a game called Puyo Puyo Tetris. It is fully, it's one of the most self-aware things I've ever seen in my life. Without exaggerating or, or, or flowering up the way it works. The literal first line of this game is is extremely close to la 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 la. Today's a perfect day. Nothing bad should happen on this perfect day where I sure do hope my friends in an adventure don't fall out of the sky. And then immediately that's what happens. And, and they battle each other by, by playing this puzzle game that they never explain the, the, the fictional in-universe logic for. It's, it's fine. It's surprisingly all right. It's... And, and, and it's also, you know, a damn good multiplayer puzzle game in the first place, which is uh, kind of why I got it up to play something with the girlfriend again on the Switch. Um, yeah, I don't know. Besides that, the weirdest thing that I think I got the most excited for for video games over the course of this past week is basically watching the Death Stranding trailer a couple more times and coming up with uh, <laughs> what, what I finally feel is a coherent image in my head of what the gameplay is supposed to look like. Uh, from the trailer, we can we can discern that it's open world action game involving gadgets and light stealth but uh there was also some some bit of fan theory going on talking about how during some segments some shots look like characters blinking from a first person perspective the the screen will like fade to black from a top and bottom wipe before jumping ahead by a few minutes or hours of what actually in these particular sequences looks like a gameplay demo um, when, when our character gets pulled down to the ground from the ghosts, the camera follows a perspective getting sucked into black goop and then wandering its way out of the black goop into the World War I battlefield before returning back to the, the game again. So I'm suspecting that that means that that's what happens when you die. You do a little tunnel shooting in a, in a combat heavy section to get back. The rest of it has uh, these characters walking across this complete vast nothingness. It ends with Kojima saying you can go anywhere. It begins with the president saying you need to go west. So that has me suspecting that you're going to have to go across large outdoor environments of fucking nothing. In the end, Kojima says you can go anywhere, even the moon. That has me kind of sort of suspecting. This is also like like the fanboy in me hoping it's a super ambitious project. That the maps are going to be No Man's Sky style spherical planets that... um are going to have a shitload of ground you need to cover to get to these uh, story scenes. Uh, from the PlayStation page, they talk about how heavy asynchronous multiplayer is. Kojima's been on an asynchronous multiplayer kick ever since that nuke ending of MGS5. PT was designed to have uh, tens or hundreds of players work their way through processes of eliminations to figure out the solution. The Death Stranding trailer that we saw last week was revealed because of 100,000 people on Twitch logging in at the same time. I think... That, that the idea is that multiple players are going to be building each other bases and bridges and um, networks of transportation in a kind of asynchronous, massively cooperative multiplayer game to uh, 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 literally rebuild a digital version of the society that had been destroyed during this apocalyptic event. And that um, it folds into Kojima's fascination with Cold War era astronauts and the space race and the moon landing and how, at least in his <laughs> idealized version of his childhood, he, he felt like the world was kind of sort of coming together to agree on space travel as a, as a common goal and a common need. But that's gone away in our more digital yet more disconnected world. You wrote, you wrote an essay over there, huh? I don't, uh, I don't know yeah. what's more, more mad... Like Kojima himself not being able to explain Death Stranding very well or George's <laughs> theories. <laughs> well, I'm also trying to like temper it with what's currently possible and currently available. And it is currently possible to make a tiny little planet Earth that uh, is going to be scaled way down. There there've there've been games that have had massive open world maps it's, in the past. I, Stuff like I don't Fuel think the it's, Division. It's I I would suspect it's going to follow the MGS5 route, if I'm honest. Where the asynchronous multiplayer is entirely no, optional and not a big part? No, the map. Ah, so, so you think we've got like, like map, three, four map. square kilometers across like maybe will, two themed Like, he worlds? will get dropped in somewhere, and instead of having a horse, he'll have that motorbike. Mm -hmm. And it will be a lot more up and down, vertical... Um, you know, going into craggy crevices and stuff like that, like it looks like in the trailer and stuff. Um, 
then which is when the, the ladders are going to come in handy. Yeah, and and, and I'm wondering if we're going to see player built networks of ladder bridges to help help players cross those those gaps that uh that that he uses the gadgets for in the trailer. Mm-hmm. If uh, or if it really is just you alone with all that distance to cover. But uh, that's that's something that it makes a lot of sense to me. It, it, it seems like a worthy, ambitious, fun gameplay concept. If you're there for the event that, that this concept would be. And uh, the biggest concern at that point would be how it's going to work offline and years from now when the servers go down. Which could happen, I don't know, like 10 to 12 years from now when shit really hits the fan. It depends how much players do have to rely on each other. Um, yep. You know. Which is the, the double-edged sword of all these live, multiplayer-centric well, experiences. Well, asynchronous is a bit different. Asynchronous, you know, Dark Souls works perfectly fine without networking. Mm. So does you can still play Demon Souls even though the network is turned off. Yeah, it, I, I don't know perfectly fine, though, because y- you do... I, I You're feel missing like having, something, but I feel like having the, the option... For, for a cooperative player to, to help you cheese some of the harder bosses is a, is a pretty smart way of, of side-loading, if you will, in an easy mode without officially having an easy mode. Like, I'm sure that the multiplayer options in Dark Souls have helped a lot of people see the end of that game that otherwise would not have been able to. And that's... Uh, also, the traps, the messages on the floor give a, give a kind of tense vibe. There's, there's mischief going on that you're going to miss out on now. It's it's a double-edged sword. You win some, you lose some. And ultimately, there's a lot more time in the future than there is in the present. So I don't know how, how well, well the, the math is, is. Until it comes out, you don't know. So it's right, not really right. something you can factor into the game, like thinking about it eight years from now. But that getting, that, that is my prediction. That. Uh, that's my prediction for what we're going to see. I hope not, but... Yeah. Anyways, I I just uh, I want to Matt. Ah. Uh, eh. 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 Matt, have you been to the uh, the cinema lately? Have I? No, not recently. Other than what I've said already. I Why? just literally before oh, the, yeah. before this podcast started, got back from the cinema. Really? I what did. did. You go see. I went to watch. The spectacle that is Godzilla, King oh, God. of All Monsters. Okay. Okay. American Godzilla 3. Now, the problem is th- that movie only has one problem. One. Too much Godzilla? Too much human drama? Humans. Oh, really? I, I heard they just did more monsters this time. Take every human out of that movie, and that movie's great. That's a little weird for me to imagine, because I liked the 2014 American Godzilla because of... There, there were some fun actors. It is so bad at times. Oh, oh no. And so it's like a downgrade, kind of? Like, more oh, monsters monsters are better, my, humans are worse? Like, I don't know. There was something like an air of mystery around Godzilla in, in the first one that made the human parts bearable, because everyone's mm-hmm. trying to figure out. It was also cheesy and fun. They've gone like the full end of cheese with this one where it's like they know all of the monsters already. They have all of these secret government projects about waking them up and controlling them and blah, blah, fucking blah. (laughs) And then they have the monsters fighting and doing shit. And it is on a scale I have never seen. And it is fucking great. (laughs) It is amazing to watch them fight. Fair fucking play to that VFX team, which must have, like, been a billion people. <laughs> yeah. That is a great, like, w- like if you just want to see shit, like, giant monsters fight each other on another level, this movie's great. But you have to bear with all of the human parts of it, which is terrible. Especially, is it Vera Flaminga? Flaminga? I forget her name. Flamingo? Uh, Doc, Doctor Strange, wow. Uh, Stranger Things, girl? No, 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 that's Millie Bobby Brown. She is, like, barely in it. She's all right. No, her mom, the woman who plays her mom in this movie, mm. 
The mum mm. character goes up there for me as one of the Ooh. stupidest, Ooh. <laughs> most... I am so angry about this character oh, and Vera. how yeah. stupid it Tell it. and ridiculous... Preach. Dr. Emma Russell. Emma Russell, this doctor, this fucking doctor that came out of nowhere, is... It makes me seethe with anger about how stupid her plotline is and how stupid her character is and how stupid the decision she makes is and how oh. fucking stupid, stupid, fucking stupid. <laughs> She's the Conjuring okay? woman. She's the Conjuring oh. one. She's from the Conjuring films. Ah. Uh, fair enough. Like, like whatever, right? At no disrespect to Vera herself, just the character she plays. God damn it. Oh, that's right. Uh, Bates Hotel. Uh, so, oh, she's okay. the mother, right? She's yeah, yeah, the yeah, mother. Yeah. She's the mother. She acts the she's same the way in, this... in every movie. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. She's oh. just like very soft. And oh. Talks oh. like this. If you want to watch a movie serious. that has spectacle, though, this is, uh, this is, this is spectacle. Like, and they just throw everything into the pot. They're like all of Godzilla law. Like you, you love it. Stir the pot. Like <laughs> fucking ancient cities and shit. Stir the pot. Get it in. Shitty, so, uh, cheesy plot lines about like humans coexisting with titans and and like that not really being good, but also good and it, it, back see, and flip flopping back and forth the, between that. They're doing uh, Brian Cranston here, where they show Brian Cranston more than anyone else during the trailer, and Brian Cranston's in there for like two seconds. They show Bobby Brown, <laughs> nobody else, only Bobby Brown, and because you didn't even know what the trailer was until like Godzilla showed up in that trailer, because Bobby Brown's was like, oh, you, everyone's like, oh, it's just Stranger Things three she, or four. To be fair, like, she's in it more than Brian Cranston is <laughs> in Godzilla. Okay, that's the barometer that's, is that she's probably in double the amount of time, which is still not a lot. <laughs> that's not a lot. Brian Cranston was in there for two seconds. Okay, four but, seconds is not enough. Godzilla and all of the monsters, Ghidorah, Mothra, like all of them, are in the movie quite a lot. And it's great. They're not holding back with this one. They're like, we are going to spend this VFX budget because we bought the cheapest actors in the world. And it is, at times, riveting to so watch. So the CGI monsters steal the spotlight? I think they're supposed to. Just like the... Sometimes the cinematography, like the shots and everything, like the build up, like when two monsters face off with each other, they obviously do the thing where they try and like cover their CGI details with like lots of smoke and lots of snow or lots of rain and that typical mm. stuff. But there are times where it's like brutal and like destruction on a, on like scales that only Man of Steel could wish it could spunk out. <laughs> like, oh man it is it is both the, epic and just flawed spe speaking about vfx you know the white suits um in iron man i mean not, sorry not iron man i'm thinking about iron man uh, uh end game the white yeah. suits that they wear that's all cgi really the, all the time what? the time traveling suits they use. yeah what the hell <laughs> They didn't have the suits ready. So, so, <laughs> so they, they had to CGI them on. <laughs> they CGI them on. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? You know, I don't I didn't even notice. I still don't notice looking at it. <laughs> wow. Wow, yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, so there's some He's really a stop over good VFX artists sure. out there. Holy crap. I still Thanks see for... the, the Hulk is like top top tier shit. Man. This 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 movie can be top top tier VFX at times. Yeah, I I I, I gotta give it a try. You know when it comes to DVD. No, Do no, say no. That? You gotta watch this shit in the cinema. Uh, don't, I was don't, wondering about that. Don't watch it on DVD because you'll just hate it. It's awful. <laughs> like, the only reason to watch it is for the fights. I get the like a supercut with all just the monsters fighting. 
with the surround sound cinema screaming of monsters at you and thunder and fire and nuclear blasts and all that kind of shit going off. If you watch it on DVD, you'll just be like, this is the worst movie I've seen in a long time. Because everything's gone. The spectacle is what carries the film. And ouch! Nah. I remember that uh, the 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 last American Godzilla movie. How how the theater just kind of rumbled with his roar and how uh, uh, at times how it's when, like wow when when Godzilla gets in and out of the ocean and the water like displaces and starts throwing ships around the the wide shots of of the cinema just kind of give it a sense of scale yeah. that that had me wondering if it would have the same impact at home yeah. this you, you this want the does sound that to tickle the spades. taint right yeah. yeah tickle the taint this does that in spades and it never gets old it never like every sound scream or like crack is just so epic and like so well done and um it's the, the guy who did all the music for it, and uh, I don't think he did the sound design, but he at least did all the music. He's the same guy who did all the music for God of War. Oh. Mm. How about that? Yeah, Bam McCready. And they I have love a that cover. guy's name. They have a cover of, uh, is it is it B-52's Godzilla? Here comes Godzilla. Yeah. They have like a, they have like a cover of that song sang by Serge Tankian from System of a Down. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie has everything. It's Blue Oyster Cult. Blue no Oyster fucking Cult. way. Blue Oyster Cult? <laughs> yeah. Here comes Godzilla. I only know it because it was on Guitar Hero way back in the day. Those, those, those guys are like the coolest uncles you, you have as a kid. The ones with the flight simulators who are into Godzilla mu movies. Well... Now you got it with anyway. Serge Tankian. And it was, it's, yeah, go watch it in the cinema. If you don't, don't watch I'm, it at all. I'm because very pleased it. with how easy that is to mentally picture. I could totally picture Serge Tank and screaming about Godzilla coming on the way and it being some kind of metaphor for, like, I don't know, UN in international interventionism. <laughs> oh my god, it makes sense. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyways. We, um,. <laughs> We, we, we got at least one fun topic in the news that, that, that I'm going to be having some fun with. Uh, I'll go take a piss. <laughs> yeah, I, w I, w I wonder how well the, 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 the Pokemon's going to last us. But, but, but I, I feel like I can at least make sense of this, this Barkley 2 story. Sport Accolade presents the most aggressive basketball game ever created for the Sega Genesis and Super NES. Barkley, Shut Up and Jam, an intense two-on-two -two jam fest starring Sir Charles and the neighborhood's best streetball players. There's even digitized commentary by Sir Charles himself. Time for some pain. Four-player adapter support, including the Hudson Soft Super Multi-Tap on the Super NES version, let four players test their skill in a basketball battle that has just the right amount of strategy without sacrificing the fast-paced action. Nobody can guard me. Play hard or get out. Barkley, shut up and jam. Hello! And welcome back to the exceptional Ooh. That and Sons podcast. Ooh. Uh, or should I say just decent? Welcome to the decent podcast. <laughs> welcome to the sometimes okay, sometimes not terrible Dad and Sons podcast. <laughs> the, the decent Dad and Sons podcast has a bit of alliteration that I like to that too. I'm going to... Decent Dad. I think that might be this, this week's title. Anyways... Um, the first news story that I like, like unilaterally pushed through the Pokemon. outline here. No, like oh, <laughs> I mean, uh, can we do? If you guys want to do Pokemon first, that's no, no, fine. No, no, let's no. talk about Charles Barkley let's, for for yeah. two hours. Yeah, exactly. I am ready to slam jam. Let's talk about a game nobody's heard of. Oh my god! No, I actually watched. Um, best friends play the first one yes the it's really thing. fun it's a surprisingly it's good game it's one of my yeah. favorite indies you gotta remember right i am not american i don't <laughs> watch basketball and i only know charles barkley because of space jam 
Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> so at least in some way, you were still there for the magic that was mid '90s basketball. Me too, uh, Liam. Uh, Me too, Liam. But Barclay, I know nothing about sports. <laughs> Barkley, shut up and jam. Gaiden is a uh, comedy spoof RPG. That, that was made by an indie team for nothing and released for free for nothing that has like surprisingly competent Paper Mario style combat mechanics where you play little mini games in the middle of, of battles that jump between this story that is goddamn hilarious. It takes place in a post-apocalyptic future that somehow like canonizes the ending of... um of of Barkley shut up and jam on on f- from the 90s and the Space Jam movie I, I I believe the end of the game has you facing off against the Monstars for for some kind of ceremonial rematch where the fate of the multiverse gets hen- hung into the balance and and they play with uh with the concept of fictional canon streaming over into real life it's where a lot of great uh uh jokes about um excessive nerd passion comes from there's there's this gas pump that you save your uh your your game at and it spouts copy pasta from from forums about how how all games are role playing games when you think about it because you're playing a role or how the uh, m- meticulous emotional magic of the vidcons can can conjure up such precious emotions that that other inferior mediums such as movies and films will just never match. It's a great game. It has a great sense of humor. I, I love that it exists, and they had a uh, sequel in the works. They they got a Kickstarter going, raised $130,000, which is all right, I guess. But um, ultimately, we're not able to keep the project together on that kind of budget under those conditions. The producer, Liam Rahm, has come out after uh, after uh, years Liam. of slow updates. Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's another Liam, so I hope we don't get confused. Um, he says, as the game continued to age, people left the project for lots of reasons, mostly uh, due to taking jobs or losing interest. The game always needed competent and constant development in order to come out under the lofty pretenses that we had established, which is a fun sentence because with a name like <clears throat> Barkley 2, a.k.a. The Magical Realms of Tir Nanolog, Escape from Necron 7, Revenge of Cook Clane, the official game of the movie Chapter 2 of the Hoops Barkley Saga, uh, you, you would expect it to be like janky and shit and silly, right? But the demos that they've released for PAX show them having the game go through through multiple genres of, of gameplay that include everything from turn-based basketball mini-games to top-down shooting to elaborate Rude Goldberg adventure game puzzle machines. And um, on top of that, you're, you, you also got to remember the original it was a surprisingly competent little indie Paper Mario, too. And there's there's weird meta narrative stuff going on, like Undertale style meta narrative stuff going on. That's more more uh, 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 it's, it's r- 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 clarified in text than than in the videos they've showed off. But for for a spoof game, for a comedy game, for an indie game, that's a sequel to a freeware game. It was a surprisingly ambitious project. And over the years, much of the original team has left due to disinterest. And this remaining producer, Liam Rom, is trying to scrap together uh, some some paid talent to to keep going. It's not officially canceled, but it is coming extremely darn close. And and I would uh, hate to see it not come to fruition, especially since. If uh, you you guys can remember that far back, one of our first guests was Kyle Javelli, aka Cute Monster Props, who helped make some trailers for them back in 2015. Uh, he made he made some props that that showed up in the the live action videos. Um, Kotaku has a post up. They've tracked down some posts from other developers. Uh, one, one of them was just had nothing nice to say, so it was horrible management. Another who I guess uh, kept. Kept a little bit of a clearer communication channels on their resume since then. Has ended up working on Katana Zero. So the developers of the original game have gone places. They've they've made a cool, great thing that is worth checking out. I They've certainly gone places with other people's money. Oh and and that's that's like the morals to this story. The sticky, nasty morals to this story is that, like you just mentioned, Kickstarter projects are not actually like an obligation to be complete no this is this is this is this is another example another painful sad example of a crowdfunding project not being able to pull it together out of sheer disinterest 
from an original development team that seemed to have a hell of a lot more ambition and passion for the project earlier in, in the years. And uh, the other thing to, to keep in mind is that, that even despite the game's nature as parody, despite its deliberate jankiness, they uh, ultimately, even, even here in this territory of spoof gaming, had feature creep and, and too much ambition and, and bloat happening. And e that can kill even the most lighthearted, comedic of, 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 of cute little indie projects. Anyway, I thought that was was you know, not an inspiring story, but an important story to share with the world. Uh, one 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 that should hopefully give both developers and fans a little more a little more caution when when jumping into Kickstarter projects like that. Yes, mm. hundred twenty thousand dollars. It's a lot of other people's money, but it's not a lot of money in game development. That's for sure. Oh yeah, that's like a, a year's salary for three people. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if they end up outsourcing it to Eastern Europe. Anyways, now, uh, the, the other story that, uh, that, that went on this week that, that you guys wanted to talk about was Pokemon. Yeah, there was a... That's Ondo. Wait, did he do Pokemon too? I don't think so. Maybe. No, it was, uh, Junichi, it was Junichi Masuda. Yeah, well, I guess Koji Kondo can't make the, all, all the beloved themes you know and love. Can't do everything. So, I, I didn't get to watch this with sound on. I, 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 I skimmed through the, the trailer here. Okay. And I'm... This is this is the Pokemon that we've been waiting for. This, this is, is this is it. I'm, I'm kind of feeling it too. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not really a fan, in. but I think I'm 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 in for this one too. Yeah, they this, kept, this looks like fun. They kept the best thing about Let's Go Pikachu, Let's Go Eevee, which was Pokemon roaming Dude. the world and knowing. Jeez, it's yeah. not like the early fucking '90s anymore. God, it took them a while. Yes. It took him a long time. A long time. Man, <laughs> Chrono Trigger had this figured out. Come on. And they did another Come great on. thing, which is they made an English person be the art director for a game inspired by England, and now look at all the cool new Pokemon that we get. Props to James <laughs> Turner, like the only Guy Kokujin at Game Freak, it seems. Wait, Guy Kokujin? Not just a regular old Gaijin? No, well, Gaijin's the derogatory term, George. Oh, really? I didn't know. I thought Guy it was Kokujin just the... Is a bit more uh, culturally appropriate. A bit more polite. Yeah. No, oh. fair p massive props to that guy being the art director on such a huge franchise and huge projects. But, you know, I guess him being English and an artist, a game freak, on a game inspired by the UK, <laughs> certainly going to help. It's it's open world. It's open world. You can see Pokemon. You can spin. I, I'm not quite sure around. about this big Pokemon thing, but th th all I care about is that it's open world, and you can see Pokemon and catch them. That's also, that's that's like the best collectathon game ever. We oh. we got a uh, release date. It's it's November. November. It's gonna be a big November this year. Wake me up when October ends, guys. And also. I can both have a giant Raichu, oh, yeah. a stadium-sized Raichu now, thanks to the Dynamax, the wonderfully named Dynamax system, and also I can have Sif from Dark Souls as a legendary Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, what is it with Japanese games strapping swords on the back of dogs? It's a myth. So, was, was that a thing? Yeah, really, you know. really? What myth? Like uh, Amaterasu controlling the sun and stuff like that. Huh. <laughs> I am... I, you, you know how intrigued I am and how much I want to throw this into a video somehow now. Like, who, like to be honest, though, like, uh, who is going to pick the terribly named and also strange-looking Zamazentia over Zamazentia. Zacian? The Sif looking sword carrying wool. I wonder if that's going to be reflected in sales numbers of the two versions. Like, I like Usually. the fact that the shield dog has a shield for a face that changes. But 
It's stupidly yeah. named. And also and it seems, doesn't have a sword in its mouth. It also seems a bit disadvantageous to put a giant target on your face. Like, like True. here, smack this thing instead of the other parts of my body. True. Also, can we talk about stereotyping that the Pokemon champion is a soccer wearing, a soccer kit wearing king with a, with a regal cape. <laughs> 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 The only thing that isn't English about him is that he looks happy. <laughs> so, so everyone's not uh, morose enough to to be realistic. Gotcha. Yeah, like Milo is getting there because he's like a little like Jim Lee to Milo because he's like swollen. He's definitely taken steroids, and Professor Mag- Magnolia looks like my vice principal at school. <laughs> Oh, like a strict old lady. I'm wondering if yeah. she's going to be a sweet old lady or a strict old lady. No, she's definitely going to be strict. Yeah. And then her granddaughter, Sonia, is like the the really kind of klutzy girl you went to school with who now like somehow runs the family business. Oh, we all know how. Just inheriting it. Yeah. It's the, it's the American dream. Have a That's rich family. <laughs> damn right. Damn right there, George. Nothing else <laughs> that you were alluding to. <laughs> no, literally not. That's that's how, man, God, sure. I'm sure that we've all had that really disappointing experience where you make really, really great grades in school all throughout your life. You work your goddamn ass off and then the rich kids whose parents have businesses just get to work at those businesses while you actually have to have to go out and talk to people even though you're an antisocial introvert nerd because the way you get ahead in this society is through networking, not through actual talent, which is really just dumb luck, but no one wants to admit it. Yeah, I, that's pretty basically what i was insinuating wow thanks george thanks thanks for pooping on my weekend <laughs> what, but, uh, uh, how can i poop on your weekend when it's only wednesday says mr who sits at his desk playing the sims in vr and gets paid thousands of dollars a month but that was like uh, one hour on a monday and you're just rolling in it rolling in it <laughs> i didn't sleep for like three <laughs> days last week to get a video out and then another one like right after <laughs> can we also talk yeah. about like why game freak should stop using rotom as like the technology in the game it just looks creepy what is rotom rotom is like a weird like electronic pokemon that they turned basically into electronic devices for you to use now it's a, now it's like a smartphone. Oh, it replaces like the Pokedex. Oh, I and it's just like looked a, it up, and it's a smartphone oh. that talks to you. There's like a plug coming out of his butt that I guess you stick in your devices. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Also, he has a portrait face and a landscape face. Oh yeah, isn't that the thing? Aren't the Pokemon gonna be like employees for the businesses, like like in Detective oh, yeah, Pikachu? Like, yeah, like working together or something. I uh, I, I hope that they are. Um, you know, paid fairly and and operate uh, hiring and advancement off of a meritocracy instead of uh, just straight up uh, inheriting your parents' connections. They don't have their body taken by the souls of human beings. Yeah, they aren't being mind controlled into being everyone's slave. It, Pokemon is like a little weird when you think about it too hard. <laughs> Bro, I just want to say these ads. On Games Radar, that you the link that you use, holy crap, they're everywhere. Oh, really? You can see those? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have it blocked? <laughs> of course. God. Uh, oh my God. You gotta tell me which one works because it's everywhere. There's a video. There's ads on top of ads on top of ads. So wh- it's what's the weird. point? Weird. I um. <laughs> I I have. Adblock Plus, and it's actually disabled on GamesRadar.com, but maybe it's actually working in connection with uh, with with another one. No, I have I have Adblock Plus, and it, it says it's disabled for oh, GamesRadar, well, and I'm I'm still I'm not seeing podcast, it. So yeah. I, I guess they don't they don't turn that they, they turn off just enough to get them to stop annoying you into to turning turning your ad blocker off. But I'm not I'm not seeing these videos. It look it looks okay to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. you got you got to do that. It's uh, what kind of a world do we live in where you can't like read the news without shitloads of ads getting in the way of the news and and and, and the video it's, playing in the background. 
it's it's becoming clearer and clearer with each passing year that the, the, the real way to to succeed in the marketplace is to just get born into an advantaged position and and that we should probably move on to the questions it, it, if you have a computer this strategy game is a must have and you see like beautiful oh, girls yeah yeah you know, i can't oh. stop seeing like every time i watch a youtube video is the mm. crazy speaking of cgi crazy good cgi for the game of thrones browser game <laughs> yeah i dude i was like wait a minute is that real it's and then you so see like Tyrion, good. and you see like oh it's not real like i can see that it's not yeah i can see that's not but i'm like the first this is so real good adult that I'm game of thrones wanting to play this browser game <laughs> It's working, oh God. but it's every advert. I don't know how much money this found. I noticed in, in recent years, I've started seeing ads that say, if you are over 40, you must play this game. Yeah, what that, I see that one too. Re- really? You guys get that too? I'm I not saw, over I 40? Saw that, I saw that today as well on a PC Gamer article. What? Are, who are they targeting? 40-year-old men, I guess. I, I guess gamers from the 80s and 90s would be approaching their 40s now, wouldn't they? Ugh. How to pay off ten thousand fast? So yeah, uh, we should we should probably move on to to, to questions now. At, the, at, the, at this point, we're 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 filling out the schedule. <clears throat> if you would like to send us thoughts, comments, suggestions, questions, complaints, cute animals to us to, to see with our face and our eyes, invoices, uh, donations to pay for VR um, devices. Send them to dad and sons podcast at gmail.com. Once again, that's dad and sons podcast at gmail.com. Our first question is going to be a weird one. It's from Colin M. Not to poke the hornet's nest of gamer-related gender politics, but oh, what's your God. take on the female characters revealed in the Death Stranding trailer? They got code names like Mama <laughs> and Fragile, and two of the three were crying. I'm not offended, in quotes, but it felt weird, like a deliberate attempt to drum up minor controversy or a half-hearted obligation to Kojima's own sensibilities. We, we sort of talked about this a little oh, last I, week. I was like, wait a minute, is this the girl saying this? Uh, then I saw Colin. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Colin can be a gender-neutral... Na- Anyways... Um, we we, really? we talked about this last week. Kojima doesn't I, really know mind. what a woman is. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious at this point. Whether oh, you're offended dear. or not, he just either either everybody around him is too scared of him because he's Kojima to tell him. Yeah, and he just doesn't know. Okay, I actually have to out myself as a little bit of a um, shitlord here because I don't know if I'm seeing it this time. Like, like, there's no one who looks as stupid as She's quiet. called Fragile and Mama. She's called Fragile and Mama. And they're crying. <laughs> and Mama. I one mean, they're all them, crying, to be honest. One of them, right? They're wearing clothes this time. One of them gets licked and in you the see, face. See, that's the problem. What, what did you just say? They're wearing clothes this time. Exactly. That's yeah. <laughs> So I don't, it, it's not immediately jumping out to me like it is other people. Like, if anything, I think if you want to look at, like, gender preferential treatment in video games in this example, it's that we're, we're having to play another grizzled male action hero who is clearly modeled after Snake Plissken from Escape from what? New York, even now, like, 30 years later after the movie, 20 years after Metal Gear caught on. I would say that, like... You can think that, but Kojima himself doesn't <laughs> help you in this regard because he retweeted a tweet from some shitlord as well who was just like, thank you, Mr. Kojima, for putting beautiful women in your game <laughs> because nobody does this anymore. <laughs> what, what the fuck is he talking? No one what does this anymore. About? I and was it, just what? playing Dead or Alive 6 like two days ago. The, what is he talking about? No one does this anymore? Just after the Death Stranding trailer came out. You know Kojima retweets people sometimes that, you know, suck his dick and stuff like that. But And, and that's like what people, the society, thinks is beautiful as well. You know, it's just like conventional crap. Well, like actresses, right? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I can, I can see it. With with the names, it, it just seems like the trailer material isn't as as iffy this time, more or less because they're wearing clothes. To me, I think I think you guys might might actually have a better eye for this than I do. I'm trying to find the tweet, but you know, Kojima tweets like. 
200 things a day. So it's a bit difficult. So, yeah. Anyways, um, shall, shall, shall we move on to uh, the next one with, with Will K's? Yep. Yeah. Um, y- yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Will, Will K uh, says that when shopping for an Oculus Quest, um, oh. well, I'm actually kind of paraphrasing uh, Will K's really long email here. When shopping for an Oculus Quest, Will K saw a VentureBeat.com article in which the reporter felt that the port E nature of the games available on a $399, $499 system meant that the price was too steep right off the bat, which led to deep pangs of buyer's remorse in this review article type thing for example the reporter lists fruit ninja being sold for 15 dollars, and more vr focused ports of games that have been available for years elsewhere are 30 dollars or more will k's question for us is what's your take on this do tech journalists have an obligation to discuss the holistic cost of a product and their coverage of a shiny new piece of technology and just how much is too much for these vr games or is this just a non-issue i think that price should factor in yes agreed reviews. Yeah, 100%. absolutely. Like, I, I know a lot of people disagree with that. It should be about the game as a piece, but that's just not the reality. Unless you are a yeah, press and you get uh, games for free to review. I, I think that that draws the line in, in like my definition of how these things work between a review and a critique. Yes. Like, a critique is just about the artistry of the thing. Review is how well the reader at the other end of the... The, the the article is gonna gonna yeah. feel they're gonna be there's making reason, use out of the information reason, they're getting. There's a reason most reviews come out before you can buy them. It is to tell people what to expect out of a product, because that's what games are, products, before people can buy them, to help influence mm-hmm. their decision or to help them, you know, wisely purchase things. Price should always, always, especially with hardware come in to the, I don't know, like, uh, to factoring a decision. Maybe not the overall score of a game, but definitely, like, it should be a paragraph about, this game is $60 right now, blah, 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 compared to games of the $20, I don't know how this matches up kind of thing. It should always be a part of a review. Uh, Remember, Will also mentioned in his emails that the, um review copies that they were getting of the hardware is for free and that from the experience of the reviewer you're not really plugged into that sacrifice and the mental stress of having to budget money for this thing yeah and uh that's something that has really skeeved me out in recent years where i've noticed that review copies i will get will include all the dlc and expansions and i don't even know if they're turned on sometimes and that's really sketchy. I don't like that. I, I'd rather them give me the uh, a copy of the cheapest, shittiest version of the thing. But that's not standard practice in the industry, and everyone knows why. It's it's to inflate those scores and and make sure that the reviews do not, in fact, experience that kind of buyer's remorse and and the stress of saving and budgeting. And uh, also making a sacrifice of, like, real-ass grocery and gas money that the end consumers have to make when they make these purchases. Yeah. Like, if that's not part of the reviewing experience, then then you have to accept that the reviewing experience is not representative of the, the consumer experience. It seems to me, especially in this case, that the, whoever he was reading the review uh, from, you know... Fruit Ninja being sold for fifteen dollars just because it's a VR game does seem like mm. a huge markup in price that should definitely be noted. It uh, could yeah, be which Oculus is... games have always been pretty expensive. Though. Well, the, like, the same with the yeah, Nintendo. Yeah, and, and tax, it needs right? to be mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Nintendo, who don't Activision. Know. There's yeah. there's a few. Well, not even that. Just like games that come out on the Switch, like Resident Evil Four, just came out on the Switch. Thirty pounds. That's like nearly hmm. forty dollars. For a game that came out 15 years ago and has been <laughs> ported to every platform in known existence for cheaper, it is absolutely, like, egregious to try and charge that I don't really much. buy stuff for my Switch anymore because of that reason. It's just like I, I wait for, like, the big games, you know, like Pokemon. I'll pay full price for that because I know I'm going to kill that game. Yeah. But, my but God. I'm not going to go outside that outside of bounds for a game I don't know if I'm going to completely love. 
for yes. 60 or something dollars. It should definitely, like, factor. Like, new games usually tend to have, especially, like, you know, big AAA releases, Death Stranding, and uh, Pokemon are going to come out pretty much in the same week. It's going to be an expensive week. And, you know, for some people, it's going to be like, well, I can only... I can only afford one of these games. So then it does come down to reading the review and seeing which one's going to suit you and like how that factors into your decision making. But like if you have Fruit Ninja and you really want to play Fruit Ninja, well, you could have it on an iPad. You can have it in VR. Yeah, the VR one might be good, but is it like fucking $12 oh, yeah. more? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. Well, VR that makes to, it all exactly. better. <laughs> well, that ha- then that just has to be reflected in the review. Yeah, I like, mean, it depends on the person, right? Depends. That person has a job yeah. and and they have extra money. Well, at the same time, like, you they, can they, pass, they can splurge right? on themselves. It's not four hundred dollars. You know how much my health insurance is? Oh God, it's about four hundred dollars. I wish I had health insurance. You know what? You know what? I want to say something. You know, fuck America, man. <laughs> Fuck America. Uh, Why can't I just get my fucking pills? Okay. (laughs) Like, why? Oh, God. Okay. That's it. That's it. Rant's over. That's it. I can either have healthcare for a month or buy an Oculus Quest. That's a decision a reviewer (laughs) does not have to make. I wish I had an Oculus Quest. (gasps) Well, okay. Can you buy two? Can you buy? Can you buy me an Oculus Quest? Yourself an Oculus Quest? And can you buy Matt some pills? Well, no, I, buy me, buy me healthcare. <laughs> I feel like I'm shitting all over everyone's weekend now. No, it's it. No, it's just it's just like okay. I need to go see a neurologist to get pres- a prescription, and going to a neurologist without health insurance is is robbery. So where where does it go? I can't go to a regular doctor and get my pills. So what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with this system? You tell me. <laughs> something is wrong something is deeply wrong and i'm not the only one this is oh my god all right yeah move to japan i you know i'm close <laughs> hey liam you, you gotta pay health insurance right but i bet it's a hell of a lot cheaper than an oculus quest do you know what's even better <laughs> you, it is and also you can get medicine and prescriptions and you can have an appointment with the doctor by just walking in Having your appointment. Oh my god. Paying for the medicine, and then. Oh my god. Even that, six months that, later, <laughs> when you get your health me. insurance, if you kept the receipt, you can go back, and you can get money back. For the difference. <sighs> Instead of all the doctors in your area not accepting new patients, because that's the problem I'm dealing with. Well, this is the thing. I had just before I started at Q, I had influenza, and I was really sick, and. My because I'd moved to Kyoto and quit my job and I was moving to Cuba, I hadn't started because I was sick. I didn't have any health insurance because health insurance in Japan is tied to your job. So I went to the doctor, I got influenza tablets, and they cost me about $150. Hmm. I mm-hmm. went back a week later when I got my health insurance and I paid $28. I just realized that, like, like me and Matt. Me and Matt were like, $150, yeah, okay. Hmm. But I bet a lot of, you know, kids listening to this can't believe that that is how expensive medicine is. That's what I pay for mine. In the UK, you wouldn't pay anything. Oh, boy. But even in Japan, even in Japan, the fact that I could go back. Yeah, keep talking, keep talking. With a receipt, with my health insurance card, and be like, I've got my health insurance now, can I have the money back? And they were like, yeah. So they gave me like $120. What? Yeah. What? They all sales are final over here. Wow, that is some. No, no. Wow. In Japan, you can just in Japan you can just go back once you've got your health insurance. You, you, you know that price, one hundred and fifty. That's regular, but that's with like good RX. If people who get pills and don't have health insurance, please look a, a coupon. It saves you hundreds of dollars on your on your prescription. Jesus. Just do it. Just don't. Just do it. Um, don't live in America. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you know, some people don't have a choice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you do. You know, I mean, people on the streets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's how that's how life works. A lot of decisions that you have to make yourself are because of where you were born. Yeah. Come yeah. live in Japan. Let's open a studio. 
You know, and George can pay for our health care. America income tax. They, they 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 make you pay income tax even if you live abroad. I'd have to change my citizenship to make it cheap and affordable. You would still have more money though. I probably would. Not probably, if you're paying like four hundred dollars in health insurance, you absolutely would. Because the max you would pay here is like $120 a month. Can we move on to the next question? I'm starting to get sad myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron W. asks, Do you think gamers are overreacting a bit too strong to things that really aren't that big of a deal? Yes. 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 Good next question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's let's save ourselves some heartache and cut it there. 